Good morning, church. How are you today? Man, you look good. You look good. You know, I love you guys. I do, man. I, I, love, I love our church family. I love you. Um, let me mention something before I get my lesson today. How many know somebody that has small children? You know somebody, just wave at me. If you know somebody with small children. I got grandchildren. That's cool. Grandchildren are like cool. You know, it's like being a grandparent is amazing. It's amazing. There is a God in heaven, and uh, he does repay you. Uh, and anyway, but I, what I want to mention to you is that you might not be aware of this. Um, we do a Saturday night service, and our Saturday night service, after the service, we do what's called date night. And date night is where we provide paid staff with background check that are trained uh, to provide child care up until 10 o'clock at night with the idea of helping young married couples or, or single parents have a date night. Uh, and there's a real ministry idea behind that. As a pastor, people come to pastors for two reasons. They come when they want to get married. Will you marry us? Even if they don't go to church, they want to go to church and get married. And then they come to the pastor when they're about to get divorced. And it's like, you know, when, 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 when they first come, you got three chairs in there. You sit in one, they sit in one, and there's an empty one. And then when they come back for marriage counseling, you sit in one, they sit in one, turn the other way, and the other one sits in the other one, turn the other way. Anyway, it's... But I have found that when you do marriage maintenance, it's much better than doing marriage crisis. And so we encourage people to date their mate. And so we provide date night. And it's a ministry we really try to do to strengthen. And part of the heart behind it is we're a military community. And in military community, they often don't have a support system. Mom and dad, grandparents, aunts and uncles aren't there, and they don't know anybody. And it becomes very challenging, very stressful. It's already stressful. I'm in a new marriage. I'm in a new location. I don't know anybody. I've got these children. You're in the military. They own you, it seems like. And it's just challenging. And so we want to come alongside and support families. I've literally had some of our military family with tears running down their eyes tell me, date night saved our marriage. Date night saved our marriage. Come on. So... So that's, that's one of the many, many ministries we do around here, and you might not need that. Maybe your children are grown, or maybe your children are older. They don't need uh, uh, to be supervised. But if you, you need that or you know someone that needs that, just put that in the back of your hair. There's Saturday night, and after the Saturday night service, child care is provided for that. Amen? All right, so hopefully you grabbed a bulletin, or not a bulletin, but an outline on your way in. We're in a series about making healing choices, making choices that bring healing and happiness into our life. How many would like to see some more happiness in their life? I just want to make sure I'm preaching to the right group. So we've been looking at the Beatitudes. You ever hear that phrase, Beatitudes? What does that mean? It means a beautiful attitude. It's an attitude that will get you blessed. And it's found in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is doing what's called the Sermon on the Mountain. And he opens up his sermon by saying, these attitudes, if you have these attitudes, they will help you get happy. They'll begin to bring healing into your life. They'll turn your life around. And so we've been looking at these Beatitudes. And the one we want to look at today is here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. And it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want you to notice, first off, what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, Blessed are the religious. Okay, and I need you to understand that. Work with me for a minute. I know we're in church. Many people would consider us religious. But I want to define religion as different from relationship. Because, because some of the most unhappy people I have ever met are religious people. Because religion works on the outside, tries to work its way in. And we get these things, what I call religiously transmitted diseases. I know what you want from me. It's not in my heart, but because you project such a powerful persona, parent, leader, whoever, I'm going to behave around you the way you want me to behave around you so that you think I'm good with God. And so we learn to play these games, which we're really creating these religiously transmitted diseases, and people who are hyper-religious 
Again, I don't confuse that with relationship because I would consider myself religious, but, I, but, in, my, my, but in my religion, there's a faith to it that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But, but, but religious people that I'm referring to, they're trying to work from the outside in. But this verse, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be perfect. What I really want is for you to be honest. If you're truthful, that will help you have a clean heart. And if I have a clean heart, here's the promise. I will see God. Now, does that mean I get to see the picture of God? Now, ultimately, when I get to heaven, we'll stand before God. And so it means, ultimately, I'll see God in heaven. But it also means in this life. Oh, come on, somebody. I've been here all day and last night. And I got more energy than most of you right now. I'm twice the age of some of you. Come on, somebody. So watch this. How many would like to see God show up in their marriage? How many would like to see God show up in their life? I would like to see God working on my behalf. I would like to see God working in my challenge, God working in my situation. God, and that's what this verse is saying. If, if you and I will get into the right heart condition, we will see God. And God's work, we'll see the beauty of God. We'll see life differently. We'll see people differently. And it will cause us to be happy, not miserable. That's the promise. But I know what some of you are thinking right now. How is it even possible for me to have a pure heart? Yes, I would love to see God show up. But if I were to honest, come on, if you were honest, if you and I were to have an honest conversation, some of you are sitting there saying, I don't think it's possible, if I'm really honest, to have a pure heart. I could play the religious game and try to look like I got one. But if I were like really, truly honest, I don't think I'm capable. Because when, come on, if I were to look into my heart, if you were to look into your heart, how many would be honest and say, when I look into my heart, I, sometimes I see issues. I see some stuff in my heart. I got some stains on my heart I can't get rid of. I got some wounds in my heart I can't seem to get healed. Some of you are sitting there saying, I know I'm not supposed to be angry. But if you were honest, say, Pastor, not only am I angry at certain people, I'm not angry at them. In fact, I actually love to hate them. That's how much I'm angry at them. It's not just frustrated. I literally love to hate them. And if I could kill them without going to jail, I would do it. Now, you're not going to tell anybody that because you don't want to sound not like a Christian. You're going to tell us what we want to hear. Others, you say, if I looked into my heart, my heart is just so full of fear. I worry about everything. I know God tells me not to worry, but I worry about my future. I worry about my health. I worry about the kids. I worry about COVID. I worry about who's in political office. I, I worry about this. And, I, and, and if you were to be honest, you're nervous about everything. If the phone rings, you start having panic attacks. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? There's this panic in your heart if you were to be honest. I know that's not what God wants from me, but if I were honest, others of you say, my battle is daily. I struggle with lust. I struggle with addictions in my life, and it's a daily battle. It's a daily challenge. I don't see no way out. Others of you, you said, Pastor, if you were to look at my heart, my heart is so broken. It's like a glass that no longer holds anything. I know people try to love me and they pour love into me, but my heart don't hold it anymore. It used to, but my heart no longer holds love. My heart used to hold dreams, but it no longer holds dreams. I, I, I can't hold a dream. I can't believe things are going to be better. My heart doesn't hold any hope. All my heart actually holds is pain. It's the only thing it seems to hold. Others of you might sit there and say, my heart is so jealous. 
I can't celebrate somebody else's success. When I see somebody else prosper, I see someone else get promoted, I see a coworker have favor in their life, I can't celebrate it. It just makes me jealous and I resent it and I don't think it's right. I don't think they deserve it. And somehow it's not fair that they're getting ahead when I feel like I'm falling behind. I can't enjoy somebody else's success. Have, have, have I got to you yet? If not, I'll keep going. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Here's what I'm trying to say. We all at different times are going to have issues with our hearts, stains on our heart we can't remove, bruises we can't seem to heal. And here's what I want you to know. You are not alone. You are not the only one. Just look around. Don't just see the religious person you see on church. See a real person. And real people have heart issues. And God is saying, I'm not asking you to be perfect I'm asking you to be honest. And, and here's what Scripture says in Jeremiah, just so you know you're not alone. In Jeremiah 17, here's what the prophet says. The heart is deceitful above all things. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever noticed your heart just gets like, I didn't even believe I could say that. I didn't even believe I could even think that. It's like it's, like it's amazing what my heart can come up with. It says it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. And I test the mind. That's why religion doesn't work. Religion is working on the outside, trying to work in. God's trying to work from the inside out. Come on, somebody. Here's what, here's what Romans says about it. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. So just look around. None of us here have arrived. None of us here are perfect in our own works and our own effort. We, we don't create. I don't have the capacity. Listen carefully. I don't have the capacity nor do you have the capacity to create your own clean heart. It literally takes a work of God to create a clean heart, and that, my friends, is a miracle. For you and I to get a clean heart, it requires a miracle. And this is the problem. We try to do it without God giving us a clean heart. So we try to, uh, okay, I need to change. I need to grow. And those are good things. I'm not saying don't try to modify your behavior because some of you absolutely need to modify your behavior. All right? I'm not, I'm not against behavior modification. You, we all need behavior modification. But I'm talking about the heart right now. I'm talking about the heart. And so often what gets going, it's like, okay, I'm going to try harder, but you didn't make it. I'm going to do better but you didn't make it. I'm going to apply myself more, and you didn't. And because you don't make it, now the guilt doesn't go away. It grows. Now hope doesn't increase. I become more discouraged. And so now the very thing I tried to do to make my heart better has actually just made my heart more sick because I didn't make it. I couldn't get the stain off. I couldn't make the change. I couldn't solve the problem. I couldn't turn it around. I tried. And that's why religion doesn't work. And this is the step. This is the choice. We're talking about healing choices. This is the healing choice where I get honest with God. I get honest with myself. And I get honest with someone that I can trust. And here's, here's the thing. I know somebody's like, why did I come to church today? Why do I want to talk about healing my heart and, and, like, and, and, and confessing to God and being honest? It's like some of you are like nervous right now. You're just so freaking out right now. You're getting all nervous. Listen carefully. This message isn't about trying to get you, intimidate you, or put some burden on you. In fact, if you're, if you're afraid to get honest, if you're afraid to get honest, because, again, let's just stop here for a minute. It's getting honest with myself. And we often don't like to be honest with ourselves. Being honest with ourselves is very painful. Here's the way we like to do it. I'm going to judge you by your behaviors. And I'm going to judge myself by my intentions. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I don't want to get it. I don't want to. It's like, no, I, don't, I didn't really mean to hurt you like that. That wasn't, that wasn't what I meant. So judge me by my intentions. No, I'm going to judge you by what you actually did. My car's totaled. My, my life's messed up. You did something. So getting honest is painful. Getting honest is scary. But here's my point. This message isn't about intimidating and scaring you. This message is about knowing the love of God. Because the Bible says in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear. He that has fear has not been perfected in love because fear has what? Torment. 
This message isn't about scaring you. This message is about getting you to know how much God loves you because he cares about the stains on your heart. He cares about the wounds in your heart. He cares about helping you get a clean heart. He knows that you can't get a clean heart on your own. He just wants you to get honest with him because he knows that you need a miracle because you and I can't do it on our own. So getting a clean heart requires two parts. The first part requires is God's part. Because, again, I already said it takes a miracle. When you and I read Scripture, let me illustrate it with a story out of the Gospel of John. When you and I read Scripture, we read the revealed stories of Jesus. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus did. But many of those stories, they carry an analogy with them, or they carry a symbolism or plurality that, that's bigger than the story itself. Yes, the story happened, but there's a principle that reveals the nature of God, reveals the character of God, and also reveals the purposes of God at work in a larger context. So there's a plurality of meaning. So in John chapter 11 is one of those stories, and this is the story of Lazarus. If you know the story, Lazarus dies. Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Lazarus is a dear friend of Jesus. Jesus shows up to raise Lazarus from the dead. He says, move the stone. And Lazarus' sister says, but Jesus, he's been dead four days. And he stinks. How many would be honest? Say, God, I don't want to reveal my heart because it stinks. I don't want to reveal what's going on in my life because it's embarrassing. It's dirty. It's gross. I, I, no, let's keep the stone right there. Let's keep this thing covered up. God said, no, let's remove the stone. And then here's what he says. Now, when he had said these things, move the stone, he cried, Jesus cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, who's he talking to? Lazarus, Jesus, the resurrection is speaking to Lazarus, come forth. And when he had, he had died, had come out, how did he come out? Bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Then Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Oh, this is, my mind is going boom right now. This is a beautiful analogy of the work of God and his collaboration with his church. This is so many Christians right here. Jesus is the one who does the miracle. Who's he speaking to? Lazarus. There's no self-help seminar that's going to solve Lazarus's problem. There, there, there's no nutritionist, no doctor, no medicine, no, no, no good deed that's going to get Lazarus out of his problem. He is dead and stinking. And Jesus shows up. Says, Lazarus speaks right through death. Come forth. But when he comes out, there's so many Christians. He's bound up in what? Grave clothes. He's bound up in death. He can't walk right. He's got Christ. This is so many Christians. We got Christ on the inside of us. We are new creations in Christ. We know that. We believe that. But past my walk, I can't walk right. Past my hands are bound up. I, I, I can't do what I want to do. I, I, I feel so restricted. I can't see the goodness of God. My eyes are covered with death. And I can't hear because my ears are covered in death. And I can't talk like I want to talk because my mouth is covered in death. And some of you are in that place. You know that Christ is at work in you, but you're discouraged because you're round up in death. You're not dead, but you've been made alive by Christ. You have Christ on the inside of you. You are a new creation, but you're struggling with this. I got, I got all this death wrapped up on me. See, that's why religion won't work. You can take death off of a dead person, and they're still dead. But Christ works on the inside to make you a new creation, to give you a new heart, to give you a new spirit. And he's trying to work from the inside out. But listen carefully. Who did he say, loose him and let him go? He said to his disciples, he said, Lazarus, I'm giving you life, come forth. But he said to his disciples, support him, help him, help him get his walk strong. 
Help him get his hands free. Help him get his vision right. Help him to hear a little bit better. Help him, help, and this is the, oh, this is so great. God is the one who gives new life. But we get the privilege of supporting him. God is the one who raises the dead. We don't. But we get the honor of supporting those that he's risen from the dead. That God is the one who gives a new heart. We don't give a new heart. But we get to support those who God has been given a heart. God has given a new heart. That's why when Jesus said, I have come in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life, his work. But you might have it more abundantly. Oh, come on, somebody. And it's God's part to do the miracle. I can't do the miracle. As your pastor, I can't do it. I'm not even going to set myself up to try to do miracles. God is the miracle-working God. He's the miracle-working God. So, so in, John, in Romans chapter 4, it helps illustrate a little bit how God does his part here. In John, excuse me, Romans chapter 4, verse 17, look at this. God, God, who gives life to who? Who gives life to the dead? God is the one who gives life to the dead. How? By calling those things which do not exist as though they did. God looks at you, and we sometimes look at ourselves, and it's like, God, I can't really see anything in me. And God said, no, 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 no. I'm calling out. I've already put my spirit in you. Now I'm calling you out of the grave. I'm calling you out of that stinky situation. I'm calling you back out of your death. I'm calling out of you what you can't see in you. I'm calling out of you what you don't think you can do. I'm reaching into your heart that you think is a mess. All I'm asking you to do is get honest with me, and I'll call you out. How many times is God trying to get you to do something and you're reminding him you can't do it because of your abilities and you're like, God's like, really, are we having this conversation? <laughs> you're reminding me of what you can't do. Should I remind you of what I can do? I'm calling out of you. I'm calling out of you what I've placed in you that's so far deep in your heart that's covered up by your shame and your sin, you don't even know who you are. You're so focused on the surface. I'm reaching beyond the stink. I'm reaching beyond your failures. I'm reaching beyond the junk. And I'm calling you out. See, have you ever looked at certain kind of seeds? Sometimes you look at a seed and it's like, that's ugly. It's not attractive. That's an ugly seed. But when a seed falls to the ground and does what? Dies starts decaying, out of it it releases what? Life. And sometimes we look at our heart and we see the seed, and God says, no, I see the harvest in your heart. I see the fruit in your heart. I see the life in your heart. I see beyond what you see, and God's trying to call out. In Rome, there's this beautiful, amazing statue of David. It was made by Michelangelo. When he had finished making this amazing statue, it's, it's, it's amazing, he was asked this question, how did you do that? And his answer was, I simply cut away all the things that weren't David. Everybody else saw a slab. He saw a David trying to get out. And God is trying to chip away who you really are. God's trying to chip away and say, oh, you're not that. You're not that. That's not who you are. Don't think like that. That's not what I got for you. Let me just chip away. Let's chip away. Let's chip away. Let me call you out. That's why the ministry of the word is so important. It washes you. God's calling you out. God's chipping away. God's washing you. And this is why when you go to church, that when you leave, there should be an inspiration on the inside of you. When you hear religion, you walk away saying, I'm not good. I didn't measure up. I don't fit. Religion puts something on the outside, but God speaks to something on the inside that's inspirational. It's the work of the Holy Spirit from the inside out. So right now, right? some of you need to write a book on that. I'll just help some of you get free. Come on, somebody. So that's God's part to do the miracle. It's not mine. And God does that miracle by calling you out chipping away and washing you. But then what's the second part? The second part is my part. 
And my part is where I cooperate with God. Everybody say cooperate. We all need to grow in this area. Cooperation. Here's what the Bible says in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. And I love what the, the apostle says here. Dear friends, as your pastor who loves you, family, dear friends, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Let me just pause right there. Work hard to show the results, not work hard for your salvation. That's religion. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Yes, I should work hard not to earn. That's religion. But I should work hard to release what God's trying to release out of my life, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. What's this next part here? For God is working in you, giving you, giving you, the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. God is at work where? In you. To do what? Give you desires. If some of us were to be honest with our own heart, and say, God, I don't even have the desires. If I were to be really honest, God, I don't have a desire to serve you. I don't have a desire to build your kingdom. I don't have a desire to use my gifts and talents for you. If I'm honest, God, God says, I know. I know. But let me give you the desires. Some of you need to pray this prayer. Some of you just need to say, God, I'm, I just want to be honest. I don't even have the desires, God, because he already knows. But, God, I'm asking you to give me the desires, and I'm asking you to give me the power so I can do those things that please you. So on a practical level, how do we actually cooperate with God? i got three thoughts I want to give you today. How do I cooperate with God? Here's, here's number one. Here's number one. Search your own heart. Search your own heart. Look what Lamentation says here. Let us, let us search and try our ways. And after we search ourselves, turn again to the Lord. When I search myself, it isn't about being shame-filled. It's about searching my heart to see what's in my heart. And when I find what's in my heart, then turn to the Lord. Let me ask you a question. You might want to write this down. You might want to write this down. What do you want? What do you really, really want in this life? I've asked that question in hundreds of different contexts. I've done leadership mentoring groups. I've done business mentoring groups. I've done pastoring mentoring groups. I will tell you, I have found it very difficult for people to answer that question. Now, most people will fire off a list like Santa Claus. And if we're, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. And, they'll, they'll, and if we're honest, I'll list off. If I'm really honest, there's some things I want. I'm not sure it's what God would want me to have, but I'd really like to have it. It's like, so I got, this, I got this naughty list over here, and I'm not sure that, but I'd like to have it. If I'm really honest, I'd like to have it. And, and then we say, okay, I got these other things. They're aspirational. They're inspirational. I'd like to have these things too. I'd like to have a good life, a good career, a good family. You know, I'd like to be happy. And we got that, we got that list. No, that's not what I'm asking. Let me ask it again. Go deeper. What do you really want? And if you go deep, you're going to want things like this. I just want to fit somewhere. I want to feel like I belong someplace. One of our deepest needs is to feel like we belong. It's amazing how many people can travel through life. Don't feel like I fit in my family. I'm married. I don't even feel like I fit in my marriage. I'm in church right now. I don't feel like I fit here. I just move through life feeling like an outsider everywhere I am. I don't know where I belong. Belonging is one of the deepest things we want. Others of you, just, I'd just like to have some peace in my life. Everything is worrisome. I'm nervous about everything. I, I just would like to have some security. It's, it's no matter how much I have, it doesn't seem to be enough. No matter, no matter how good things are, I'm still worried about it. it's just going to fall apart. I would just like to have some security or some peace in my life. Others of you might say, I just, I just want to be loved. I don't feel good enough. I, I, I don't even want to try anymore. I just want somebody to look at me and say, I love you just the way you are. I just, I just want to be accepted and loved right where I'm at without earning it. I don't, I'm don't. i tired of trying to earn somebody's approval. Others of you, your, your deepest desire, I just, I just want my life to matter. I just want to feel like my life has significance and value, that my contribution to life is making a difference. Whether that one or more of those things spoke to your heart, 
here's my thought for you. Every one of those deepest desires are all connected to your relationship with God. God is the one who gives you your heart's desire. That's why that scripture says, search your heart, find out what you really want, and then turn to the Lord because he's the one that can only give you the deepest desires of your heart. And this is called taking a moral inventory of searching my heart. This isn't just looking around at all the junk in my life. I got lots of that. But what, are, what do I really want? And here's what the Bible says in Psalms 139. Psalms 139 verse 1, it says, God, you have looked deep into my heart. Lord, you know all about me. God already knows what's in your heart. God already knows. When I read a verse like this, I like, well, God, if you already know, then why do I need to look? Why don't you go do an investigation and come back and give me a report? Right? Can I get a witness from anybody? That's the way I roll. It's like, it's like I don't do details. I don't like details. Details just stress me out. It's like, just let's just do the big picture and then somebody else figure out the details. That's, that's the way I roll. That's why I need people in my life that do details. And God says, no, David, you get to do the details on this. Why does God want me? If he already knows what's in my heart, why does he want me to do the details? Because God wants to reveal some things to me that I might need to learn. Because listen carefully, if I don't know my need and I don't know how big my need is, then I can miss how big a miracle God does in my life. It's easy for the person sitting there struggling with an addiction to say, I need God. It's easy for the person who's made some really poor moral decisions and committed adultery and stolen and say, I need God. Before the person who might be sitting there and say, I, I never did all this. I grew up a good kid. I've never cheated on anybody. I've never lied to anybody. I, 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 I've never committed adultery. I've, I've never done drugs. I've never smoked a cigarette. And we can sit there and think, I'm, I'm, I'm so much better than everybody else. And we can miss. In Luke chapter 7 is another story of Jesus. In Luke 7, Jesus goes to a religious person's house. His name was a Pharisee. His name was, his name was Simon. When he goes into Simon's house, he's there. This woman, the Bible says, and she was a known sinner, comes in, and she begins to kneel behind Jesus and cry all over his feet. She begins to take the hair of her head and wipe the feet of Jesus off. And she takes some oil and pours it on Jesus' feet. All the while this scene is playing out in Simon's house, Simon is standing over, and he's looking at Jesus. He's looking at this woman. He's watching this play out, and here's what he's saying. He says, if Jesus was really a man of God, he would know what kind of woman this is that is touching him, and he would forbid her from touching him. And Jesus knows what's in Simon's heart, so he turns around and says to Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon says, go ahead and say it. He said, Simon, there was a man who lent money to two people. One of them he loaned 500 denarii, which would be about two years' worth of wages. That's a lot of money, two years' worth of wages. The other he loaned 50 denarii, which would be about two months of wages. He said, Simon, neither one of them could repay their debt. So the person becoming the owner become very generous, and he forgave both of them. Simon, here's my question. Of the two, which will love the money lender the most. And Simon says, I suppose the one who forgave the most. He says, Simon, that's a good answer. And then you just got to use your imagination. Read the Bible. The Bible says, Jesus looks at this woman on the floor, known sinner, while he's talking to Simon. He's looking at her. I see you. I see you. I, I see you. But he's talking to a religious person. When I came into your house, you didn't give me no water to wash my feet, Simon. But she's not ceased to wash my feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. And Simon, when I came into your house, you, you, you gave me no kiss. You didn't even greet me. But she, she's not ceased to kiss my feet from the time I got here. And Simon, you, you gave me no oil to anoint my head, which would be customary but she has taken this very expensive perfume and anointed my feet. Yes, her sins are many, but she has been forgiven. Which one left that house today more grateful? 
Simon, who thought he was better and didn't realize how serious his sin was? Or the woman who knew she was a sinner? Here's my point. When I take inventory, it helps me to realize just how good God is to me. Because God, no matter how good I am, I'm not good enough. God, no matter how hard I've tried, I've not measured up. I know that I need a miracle. So, God, I'm asking you. Psalms 139 says that this way. I'm asking you to search me. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, if there's judgment in me, would you reveal it? If there's bitterness in me, would you reveal it? If there's an attitude that's unpleasing to you, if there's a thought that's blocking me, if there's something in me, God, if there's an anxious thought in me, and see if there is any offensive way in me. That's what religious people, religious people don't know they're offensive. Do you remember the Apostle Paul? Before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. And he was literally a terrorist who went around persecuting and killing Christians in the name of God, thought he was doing the will of God. Jesus finally showed up in a blinding light and said, what are you doing, dude? Why are you persecuting me? I'm not persecuting you. I'm defending you. No, no. You got this backwards. Shook his life to the very core. He thought he was so right when he was actually so wrong. And some of us need to have a religious breakthrough. Oh, we know the other needs. It's oh, those, those sins are so, the, yes, she's a sinner. But God, am I Simon? God, am I Simon in my arrogance? God, am I Simon in what I know? God, am I Simon in the longevity I've been in your church? God, am I, have I become Simon, God? This is the way I pray. Search me, God. Search me, God. If there's something in me, if there's a thought that I have that blocks me from seeing you, get that, help me get past that thought, God. If there's an anxiety in me that's keeping me from trust you, search me, God. God, reveal to me what I need to reveal to you. Here's number two. Get honest. Practice honesty. My time is all up, but let me mention this. How often do you take a shower? Hopefully every day, right? Most people like every day. Unless you're out in the field, some of our soldiers. Hoorah, come on. Somebody. <laughs> but, but generally, we take one every day, right? I got a question for you. Have you ever taken two showers in one day? Wait, if you've ever taken two showers in one, what's wrong with you? I got a guess. I have a guess. I guess that you got clean the first time, and you went and did something and got dirty again, and you felt the need to get another shower. Right? Did you walk into the shower and have the shower say to you, what's wrong with you? Didn't I just give you a shower earlier today? Was it once good enough? Did the shower shame you? Or were you ashamed to go back to the bathroom a second time because you needed another shower? Or did you come into the house trying to hide your mud from the shower? Don't let the shower see me. I got dirty today a second time. Well, that's what we do. God cleanses us. We mess up. But instead of running to God to get cleansed again and, and, and to get honest with God, we hide, we run, we withdraw. And God is saying, I just want to cleanse you one more time. I just want to wash you. Don't let that get on you. Don't let that get on you. Here's what the psalmist says. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. And I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And what happened? You forgave me. And my, and my what? My guilt, my dirty heart, my dirty heart, my dirty heart, my convicted heart, my unclean heart is gone. Practice honesty with God. God, 
help me again. God, do it again. God, cleanse me again. And number three, surround yourself with godly community. Live in godly community. How do I cooperate with God? Search my heart, confess my need, and surround myself with friends to my destiny. Here's what the scripture says in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is the light, if I walk in the light, remember Jesus and Lazarus, come forth. That's God's work. That's miracle. Come forth. That's the vertical. 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 That's the power of God. If I walk in the light as he is the light, but then we have fellowship horizontal with one another. Loose him. Vertical, God, horizontal, relational. If we walk in the light as he is the light, then what do I do? I have fellowship with one another. And in that fellowship with one another, I'm sharing who I am. I'm sharing what I'm dealing with. I'm sharing my challenges. I'm sharing my difficulties. I'm sharing parts of me in the light of fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies from all of our sins. If we claim we don't have any sins, I walk in fellowship with you, but I, I, don't, I, I don't got no issues. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us and purify us from all what unrighteousness. That doesn't mean we go conf share our story with anybody, and it doesn't mean we share it with everybody. It, we should share it with safe people. And some of the most safe people you can ever share with is somebody who's been there. Been there, done that. That's why we do support groups here. So we do things like celebrate recovery. We, we don't give you new life. We don't give you new life. That's God's work. But we want to help get the grave cloths off of you from people who have been there, done that. We, 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 that's why we do things like divorce care, people who have been rejected and their hearts are wounded and got these pain on their heart. We, we don't give you the new life. God gives you the new life, but we want to come alongside you and help get the grave cloths off of you, get the shame off of you, get the guilt off of you. That, that's why we do things like grief share when your heart has been traumatized by a huge loss. We don't give you the power of a resurrection, but we come alongside you to help get the grave cloths off of you and live in godly community. That's why when you're struggling with addictions like sexual addictions, we have things for sexual purity to come alongside. And, and, and the people that you're going to talk to, guess, I get it, been there, done that. I understand. No judgment here. No judgment here. It's not a superiority. It's a brother to brother walking in the light, walking in fellowship. Come on, somebody. And why is that important? We need relationships in our life because there are going to be times when you need support. There's times when you need support and you need somebody to come alongside and say, I'm here. I got you. I'm with you. There are going to be times in your life when you're, you're just going to be discouraged and you need encouragement and you need somebody to speak into you and say, you, you can do this. You got this. Keep going. I believe in you. There's going to be times when you just feel it's so hard, it's so big. I, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can make it. And you need somebody to look across you and say, I, I know, I've been there. I face the same thing, but I will tell you there is hope. There is hope. Don't lose your hope. Sometimes you need somebody that can give you their wisdom and tell you, okay, this is what I did, and it helped me. This is the people I did, and this is the things I did, and this is the steps I've taken, and, and it helped me, and it can help you. We need community, godly community, that helps get the grave clothes off of us, and, and that's the kind of church we want to be. I mean, if, 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 you, if you're looking for a church that's got it all figured out, uh, I'm sorry. No, I made a decision a long time ago. I will be a pastor for broken people. This will be a church for broken people. And we're believing God to do healing. God, we're believing you to do what you do. We, we don't take that on. That's not our role. We are not God. But God, every time you raise them from the dead, we want to come around them and help get them to live in their freedom. Hey, guys, my time is up. Could you stand to your feet? I want to close with one last verse. I want you to help me read it together. But this verse is from the life of David, King David. The Bible says about David, he was a man after God's own heart. Let me say that again. God said he's a man after my own heart. The Bible says about David, he served his generation by the will of God. But if you read your Bible, it's like David had issues. 
David had issues. He commits adultery. The woman he commits adultery with, he gets her pregnant. He calls for her husband to come back and tries to cover up what he's now done. But he's so loyal to David, instead of going and having a sexual intimacy with his wife, he sleeps at the door of the palace because the armory's out in the field fighting. Some of my brothers in the military understand this right here. He says, I'm not here for myself, I'm here. And so, so he's not leaving, and David says, man, this is a real problem. So David writes a letter with his own hand, gives, seals the king's signature on it, puts it in Uriah's hand and says, deliver this to the captain of the army. Uriah goes back to the battlefield. He hands it to Joab. Joab opens the letter, and here's what the letter says. Put Joab in the heat of the battle, and when the enemy responds, withdraw from him. Are you kidding me? This is one of his most loyal soldiers who has committed adultery with her wife. To try to cover it up, he brought, her, brought him home. That didn't work, and so now he's going to take him out in battle. Come on, we got some soldiers in this house. What would you think of a commander who offered an order like that? What would you think of a leader who offered an order like that? That's as about as ugly as it can get. This is a guy that God said he's a man after my heart. I don't tilt. But here's one of the things that David would do when he got confronted. He would come back to the shower. He would come back, and here's what he said. I want you to say this with me on three, one, two, three. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God, I blew it. I blew it, God. Do a work in me. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. If you're in this room and you're saying, Pastor, I, I need God to do a work on my heart. With eyes closed, would you raise your hand? God, I, 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 when, I, when I take inventory, I know that I need Christ in my life. I know I need a healing work of God in my life. If that's you, just come on. Hands up all over this place. It takes courage. This is honesty right here. This is honesty. This is courage right here. Saying, God, I need you. God, I need you. God, I got some issues in my life. I got some things in my life. All right, you can put your hands down all over the place. Hands went up all over the place. I want us all to say this together. Support those who raise their hands. Father, in Jesus' name. I come to you today because I need a miracle. I need you to give me a new heart. I need you to clean my heart. There are some stains on my heart I can't remove. There are some wounds on my heart I can't heal. So I'm asking you for a miracle. I'm being honest with you. I want to cooperate with you. I'm asking you to search me if there's anything in me that you want me to bring to you in the light. I choose to do that. I ask you to surround me with good people who will encourage me as I make this decision to put my faith in your son, Jesus. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on.